Hi, and welcome to the worship service for the Los Banos United Methodist Church and the Dos Palos United Methodist Church, and I'm Pastor Jim Garrison, and we're glad that you joined us for online worship today. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you that you've promised when we gather in your name that you are here with us. And Lord, we thank you for this manner of being able to gather electronically. And we pray that you will still keep that promise and that you will be with us through your Holy Spirit in each one of our hearts. And that we'll feel your presence and we'll be able to worship you and hear from you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And our today we're going to be talking about God's working in our lives and how, how sometimes we can't see what's happening out in the future. And so this first song reflects on that theme um, farther along. Tempted and tried with from Romans chapter 8, verses 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
If you have prayer concerns, we encourage you to either call or email to deliver those to the church office, and we can put those on the prayer chain. We encourage you to utilize the church website, and that information will be on the screen. And there at the website, you can look at the church newsletter for news of what's happening in the congregation, upcoming and, and past. And you can also check out the, the worship videos, this video and the children's messages and from previous weeks. You can also give through the church website. There is a, a place there to give securely. And you can also give through a phone app called Give Plus. And you can give through um, just mailing into the church office at Los Banos and, and Dos Palos. That's the, the main way of giving is to mail it to the church office. And so let's say a prayer now um, for our offering. God, we thank you for the many gifts that you give to us. We thank you for how you have faithfully given to us. We thank you for the rain that we've received this weekend and ask for more of it. And we thank you for the faithfulness of your people as they as we are able to take what you've given to us and return a portion of it to you, recognizing that you're the source. And we ask you to take these gifts and transform them into ministry of love in your name in our community and world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the reading of God's word from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, and starting with verse 15. This is really the end of the story of Joseph, which started at least 20 chapters earlier. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll recap the story a bit later, but we'll start, we'll start with the ending. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back in full for all the wrongs which we did to him? So they sent a message to, J to Joseph, saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you... You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. God, we thank you for the power of your word, for the power of your work in your people's lives. Back in the, in the first book of the Bible and today, Lord, work in our hearts today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, as I said, that was that was the end of the story. I want to go back and recap the story a bit. Once upon a time, there was a man named Joseph, a man that God was that was blessed and used by God in some very unusual ways. Joseph's great grandpa was Abraham. Abraham, to whom God called and said, Abraham, I want you to get up from where you are and go to a land where I'll show you. I'll be your God and, and I will take you and I will give you many descendants, so many that they will become a great nation. And I'll lead you to a place and that will be your land. And I'll be your God and you will be my people. And Abraham got up and he went. And Abraham didn't have any children. But God kept his promise, and miraculously, in their old age, Abraham and Sarah were able to conceive and bear the child Isaac, whose name means laughter, because they thought it was so crazy that they would have a baby when they were that old. And then Isaac, he and his wife bore, the, bore a child, um, Jacob. And Jacob was Joseph's father. Jacob got his name changed to Israel. Later, So when we talk about the nation of Israel or the, the tribes of Israel, these are the, the 12 sons of Jacob, and we'll come to them in a minute. Jacob had kind of a crazy story. He and his brother Esau were twins, and, and actually Esau was born first, and Jacob just a few minutes later. But the, the firstborn was the one that inherited the most, the birthright. And, but Jacob tricked him into trading that away for just a, a bowl of stew. 
And Jacob came in and tricked his father into receiving the blessing that should have gone to the firstborn son that, that came to him. And even though he was prophesied to be the one through whom the promise was going to be kept, he tried, he schemed and tried to get it on his own way. And his scheming caused him to be, to cause his brother to want to kill him. And when his father died, when Isaac died, then, then Esau wanted to kill Jacob. And Jacob had to run away. And he, and he went to his, his uncle Laban. And, it, and, and there he, he fell in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. And, and he wanted to marry her. And Laban tricked him. The trickster got tricked. And he swapped sisters on him. And, and he married the wrong sister. And he had to work another seven years to marry the one that he wanted to marry. They had, they had more than one wife commonly in those days. And so, so then Jacob and, and he and his wives and then their, their servants who they offered to also be able to bear children, they bore Jacob 13 children, 12 boys and, and one girl. Dinah gets left out of the list pretty often, the, the one daughter. And these 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. And the two children that came from Rachel, the dad's favorite wife, were Joseph and Benjamin. And she had been unable to have children and, and finally she was able to. And so these these two were were the youngest, the children of his old age, and he, he doted on them, and Joseph was was his favorite. And he, he kind of spoiled them. He, he gave him a special coat, some say a coat of many colors. It could have just been a very ornate coat, uh, the translation, but, but so, a really fancy clothing, better than anybody else had. And, and sometimes he would send him out to go check on the brothers, and he sometimes would bring a bad report back. And so they, they thought of him as a snitch and, and this, this little brat, and he's always telling on us. And, and, then, and then Joseph had these dreams. He had these amazing dreams where God, um, they're prophetic dreams. But Joseph maybe wasn't the most tactful in the way he presented him. He said, I had this dream where, where I, the, 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 there were these 12 sheaves of wheat and, and mine stood up and yours all fell down and bowed down before me. And they say, wow, oh, you little jerk. Why do you think that you know, we're going to come, come worship you? Don't, don't, don't be so arrogant. And they hated him because of these dreams. And one time, the brothers were out watching the sheep far away, and, and Dad sends Joseph out to go check on them, see how things are going. And he trots on out there, and it's, it's a couple days' journey before he can catch up with them. And when they see him coming, though, there's that crazy, arrogant dreamer. He's coming now. He's probably going to snitch on us. You know, we ought to, we ought to just kill him. We, ought to just, we, we should get rid of him. And so they were going to, they were going to kill him, but... But one of them, Reuben, said, hey, let's, uh, let's don't be too hasty. Let's, let's throw him in this big empty well, a cistern, a big thing that it normally would hold water, when, but it was, it was used up and it was dried up. Let's throw him down this, this dry well. And Reuben's plan was just to buy some time, and when the brothers weren't looking, he was going to let Joseph go and send him home. But in the meantime, this caravan comes along, this this camels and and traders that are coming from Midian and they're headed to Egypt and and Judah one of the brothers said you know he is our brother we shouldn't kill him how about if we sell him as a slave to these traders and then we'll be rid of him and we'll have a little bit of money too and we won't have to kill our brother and so they decided to do that and, and they sold him and and then to cover up what they had done they took his fancy coat and they they, they slaughtered one of the, the sheep and they poured the blood, they smeared it around on the, on the coat and they tore the coat up a little bit. And then they went to their dad and said, Father, we found this coat. Is this, is this Joseph's coat? And he, and he said, oh no, my son, he must have been attacked by lions or something and, and killed out in the, in the woods. And so Joseph gets, they think he's dead. The father thinks he's dead, but he gets carried off as a slave to Egypt. And there he gets sold to a man named Potiphar, and he starts working for Potiphar, and he's, God is blessing him, and he does a good job, and he organizes things, and so he gets promoted to where he's the, the chief steward over his whole household, and he runs everything, and, and Potiphar is getting rich because all of his, his businesses are being run so efficiently by Joseph. But Potiphar's wife becomes attracted to Joseph. He's a young, good-looking guy, and, and she, she tries to seduce him. 
and 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 he's saying, no, no, that would be wrong. I'd be I'd be violating my the trust of my master. And she kept pursuing him on this. And and then one day, when they were he was in the house where she was, and she grabbed him by the cloak and said, come and lie with me. And he said, no. And he and he ran out, and his cloak came off. And then she she cried out and said, this crazy Hebrew guy tried to rape me. And and so they arrested him and they threw him into, into the dungeon where the political prisoners were held. And so there he was, even though he was innocent, falsely accused, mistreated because of his race in a different country. And he's there in this prison. But the warden notices him and, and God gives him favor in his eyes and he starts putting him in charge of things. And, and he starts running the prison more efficiently and things are going better. And so he's, he's, he's found favor there and he's, he's doing a good job. And God has also given him the ability to interpret dreams. And so two of the other prisoners, one was the cupbearer of the Pharaoh and one was the, one was the baker of the Pharaoh, the royal baker. They both had these dreams, these funny dreams. One had about a basket with some wine in it and, it, and he poured wine into a cup and he gave it to Pharaoh and there was three branches. And, and then the other one had a, a dream about three baskets with bread on it and birds coming and, and eating the bread off and and, and, Joseph, and they said, these dreams really bother us. We had them at the same time. What do they mean? And he said, well, let's see if God tells us. And, and, then, and God gave him the understanding of the dream. And he, and he told the, the cupbearer, your dream means that in three days, Pharaoh is going to bring you up out of prison and restore you back to your, your current position, your, your former position where you can serve wine to the Pharaoh. And that indeed was what happened. And the baker... He said, your dream, his answer wasn't so good on this one, your dream means that in three days, Pharaoh's going to cut off your head. And that indeed also happened. And Joseph said, but when you get released, he said to the cupbearer, please tell Pharaoh that I'm here and I'm innocent and, and I should be released. But when the cupbearer was released, he forgot to mention anything about Joseph to the Pharaoh. Probably he didn't want to even bring up the subject that he'd been in the dungeons because that would remind Pharaoh that he had been very mad at him at one time. So it was like, let's just forget all about that. But then the Pharaoh had these weird dreams. The Pharaoh had these dreams that there were, that there were seven beautiful, um, fat cows, healthy looking cows that, that came up out of the Nile river. And they were just so beautiful. And then following them, seven scrawny, skinny, emaciated cows came after them and they ate the seven fat cows, and they still didn't look any healthier, any, they, they still looked scrawny and skinny. And he had the same, similar kind of dream with seven stalks of wheat, full, beautiful stalks of wheat with lots of grain in the head. Then after that came seven withered, um, blighted, scrawny stalks with, with hardly any grain, and they devoured the other one without being any fatter themselves. And the Pharaoh couldn't figure out what this dream was. His wise men couldn't figure out what that dream was. And the cupbearer said, oh, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention this, but while I was in, in the prison, I met a man that could interpret dreams. And he interpreted my dream and, and told me I'd be released and, the, and that the baker would be killed. And that's exactly what happened. And so they brought this, they brought Joseph up out of the prison, cleaned him up, got him all washed up and brought him to the Pharaoh. And, and says, can you interpret the dream? Says, no. But God will tell the Pharaoh what he needs to know. And so he heard the dream and, and he was able, by God's help, to give him the interpretation of the dream. He says, it's the same dream, the seven cows, the, same, the seven grains of wheat, uh, followed by this, the, the good ones, followed by the skinny ones. It's the same story. There's going to be seven good years, abundant years, full crops. And they're going to be followed by seven really bad years, years of famine and want and f crop failures. And the bad years are going to be so bad that they will use up all the abundance of the good years and, and the people will be starving. So what you ought to do, Pharaoh, you ought to find somebody, some wise person. I don't know if he was hinting at that point. You ought to find some wise person to put in charge that during the seven good years, you store up all the abundance Put it in your, build granaries and, and, and save up lots so that when the bad years come, you'll have enough and, you'll, and you will not starve. And so they did that and they put 
Joseph in charge. And he did such a good job that he became elevated like the vice president, basically. Right? The one number two ruler right under Pharaoh. And just as they said, the seven bad, the seven good years came and they stored up all this grain. And then the seven bad years came and they started having to, to dole it out and to, to sell it to the farmers and to... And then other countries were also experienced the famine. And it even happened up there in, in the land of Canaan where, where Joseph's family, his father and brothers, were, and their families were living. And on the second year, they came and he said, go down to Egypt. Dad said, go down to Egypt and buy some grain because we're starving. And, and they came and they had to be, come before Joseph. But they didn't recognize him because he was dressed up like an Egyptian and they had no way of thinking he would be in a position of authority and they didn't recognize him. But Joseph recognized them. He, these, these are the brothers that, that were going to kill me and sold me off as a slave that mistreated me. And he puts them through some hoops first. He, he kind of tests them and messes with them for a bit. He, puts them, he sneaks some stuff into their sacks. And then he sends his guard out there to arrest them and, and accuse them of stealing. And he says that they're spies. And, and then... But then he lets them go and, and come back. And they said that they have one more brother, this younger one, Benjamin. He says, well, next time you come, bring Benjamin. I want to see that you're telling the truth. If not, you're not going to get anything from me. And so they take it home and, and they, they eat the food. And then later they run out of food. And the dad says, go back and get some more. And they, and they said, well, he said, we have to bring Benjamin. And the dad says, no, no, I don't want to send Benjamin because I already lost his brother. I'm afraid to lose Benjamin. It would just break my heart. And... And they say, we can't go. He told us, do not come again if you don't bring your brother because you, it'll prove that you're a liar. And so finally the dad relents and, and they go and they, they come with, with Joseph as well. And then while they're there, finally Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And he says, it's me. It's me, Joseph. And and he invites, he says, there's going to be several more years of famine. Go up and get dad, get everybody, bring them all down here. I'll take care of you. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to take care of you. And he sends for them. And they live there and, and, and they're, they're settled there in Egypt. And then later when the part that we read after, after the dad, after Jacob dies, the brothers are afraid. You know, maybe he was just... For, you know, maybe he was just holding off as long as dad was alive, but now that dad's gone, he's going he's gonna to get his revenge on us. And they, and they made up this story that, that dad had asked them to forgive. But basically they were saying, please forgive us for dad's sake. And Joseph said, I forgive you. You meant it for evil. You did something bad. You were trying to hurt me, but God took that and did something good. You meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. The fact that I was here to, to be able to save the lives of many Egyptians by storing up this food and then to be able to have plenty of food to be able to sell to you. Look how many people didn't starve to death. God did. He saved many, many lives. Even though you meant it for evil, God brought great good out of these things. And he forgave his brothers. Romans 8.28 says, God causes all things to work together for the good of them that love God. It's important to be careful of that verse. God causes all things to work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. I don't believe that that means that God directly causes all things, that God causes all evil things, that God caused those brothers to sell Joseph as a slave. That was, that was sinful. God is not the author of evil. But God can somehow use even evil actions and can bring about good results out of it. We can't figure that out sometimes, how he does that, because it's, it's, God is amazing. He's mysterious. How he can allow us to have our freedom, how he can allow us to do things that are contrary to his will, and yet can somehow twist them around and bring out good results out of it. It's a powerful story. And, and next week, we're going we're gonna to look at it for, the, for this week and next week, too. But, but today, I hope we can take away three things from this story. And the first is, I hope that you can take great comfort and assurance in this promise we find in Romans, that God causes all things to work together for the good. And that, 
the God is even able to bring wonderful results out of horrible actions of, of willingness to kill or to sell as a slave your own brother and to break the heart of your father over jealousy. God could even take horrible actions like that and can bring about results that saves many, many lives. God can bring wonderful results out of horrible events. And secondly, when you're experiencing painful circumstances, I hope that you will have faith that, that God has not abandoned you and that God will bring something good out of what you're going through. I can imagine how easy it would have been for Joseph to just despair when he was down in the well, when he was in the caravan, when he got sold as a slave, and then when he got thrown into the dungeon. Oh, how could things get worse? I didn't do anything wrong, and yet here I am, all these things. He could have felt like God had abandoned him, but God was with him, and God prospered him in those situations and then got him out of those situations and, and, and elevated him to something that is hard to imagine how he ever could have achieved that. So never lose hope. God is with us, and God can do things in your life and in your situation that just seem impossible, and we can't even imagine what those things might be. And thirdly, I hope that, that when you express your confidence, I, mean, I hope that you, that you have confidence that God is going to work in your lives even through the bad stuff. But when you express that confidence that God can bring good out of a bad situation, I hope that you don't do it in a way, I hope that you learn to do it in a way that doesn't blame God for the bad events, for the bad situation. That we don't imply that God planned for the tragedy in order to bring about a blessing. I mean, imagine a couple whose, whose young child got run over by, by a drunk driver, was killed in an auto accident, called by, caused by a drunk driver. <clears throat> and some well-meaning Christian says to them, this is all part of God's plan, and he's going to bring even greater blessings out of this. Will that sound very comforting to the parents? I mean, God wanted to kill my kid? God, does that sound like a loving God that couldn't God think of a better plan to bring some blessings than to have my child killed? I think we need to be careful in the way that we say it, that not to, not to blame God for evil, but to say that, that God is able to bring good even out of evil. When we say something like, well, everything happens for a reason. We're saying that sometimes to express our faith that God, that God can bring good out of everything. But people sometimes will misunderstand us as if we're saying that God caused the bad thing, that God caused you know, some, some crazy person to come and start shooting school children. Even though many people might turn to the Lord and there might be more faith and, and good things might come out of that, it's a horrible thing. And God did not send that man to, to shoot those children. But God can bring good out of bad situations. We're in a fallen world, and God allows that to continue. God has given us this freedom that he intends for us to use to turn to him. But we've used this freedom, and so as we often do things so we hurt one another. God doesn't make us do those things. That's sin. God, doesn't, God wants us to not do those things. But even when we do sin, even when we make mistakes, even when just the natural consequences of being in a world that's no longer... Um, no longer the Garden of Eden, no longer just the way that God designed it, but we've fallen away from God's plans. Bad things happen. There's wars, there's famine, there's accidents. And someday God's going to put all that right and we'll, we'll be living in heaven and, and we'll understand it all by and by, like we sang in a song. But in the meantime, God is working through those things. And even when something bad happens, God is able to, to turn it around and to produce good out of it. God is so... Why? So ingenious that in spite of these normal, painful consequences of a fallen world, in spite of the harmful actions of human beings, God is still able to work in all things to bring good. God didn't mean for Joseph's brothers to sell him off as a slave but God incorporated their evil action into his bigger plan to save the nation, to preserve the people of God. 
You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God used the events of Joseph's life to, to continue the plan that he started with Abraham, to make him into a, a great nation, to, to, to grow until they had descendants that would be more than the sand of the seas and that would um, be a blessing to, to all the world, eventually leading to Christ, who would be the Savior of all the world. So you're included in that plan too, that plan that Joseph was part of, that plan of, of keeping the the people of God alive that, that would continue to eventually be the, the, the ancestors of Jesus who would bring us the knowledge of God and, and Jesus who then would be the Savior of the world and comes to you. And whatever's happened in your life, there may have been bad things, good things. God is able to use all those things to bring you to the point of saying, God, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Forgive my sins. Come in and take control and help me to follow you every day. Will you join in God's plan? And I invite you to look back and see how God has been working all the way through to bring you to the point of following him and trusting him. And whatever you're going through now, whether it's things related to the pandemic or just the, the normal struggles of life, believe that, that God is able to take even the hard stuff, even the bad stuff, and if we'll trust him, He'll able to, he'll, he is able to do good in our lives and in this world. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you are good and that nothing can, can stop you from doing your great work. And Lord, you are so amazing that you're even able to take that which is bad and to use it to produce what is good. And so, Lord, we, we want to trust ourselves to you. And especially when we're going through hard times, Lord, help us not to lose hope, but to trust in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks for joining us for worship. Now go forth with the assurance that that God is good all the time and that God's goodness will bring good in your life even when you have to go through hard times. Trust in him now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.